Welcome to Alaska Edition, a weekly public affairs program produced by Alaska Public Media in the studios of KAKM. Hello and welcome to Alaska Edition. I'm your host, Zachariah Hughes, and today we are talking about how video and new media are shaping the way we get our news. Whether that's viral videos about kayak-eating bears or uh, footage of alleged police brutality, some of Alaska's biggest stories in the last year started as clips on social media. Simultaneously, more news is bubbling up from readers, listeners, and viewers themselves. It's a topic that can be equal parts irreverent and severe, and to talk about it, I am lucky to be joined by two Alaska journalists who cast very long, very esteemed shadows over newsrooms across the state. Julia O'Malley is the Atwood Chair for Journalism at the University of Alaska campus and a veteran, very decorated veteran of Alaska <laughs> News and Newsrooms. That, welcome for being here. Uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. And Kyle Hopkins is the digital director for KTOU uh, Channel 2 News and also a veteran of the Anchorage Daily News. Um, Kyle, to start out with you, I just want to ask, what were some of the biggest videos and news stories that you guys saw at Channel 2 this year? Well, um, the, the, the biggest videos are often different than the biggest news stories. The, the videos that do that go viral for us. Um, a lot of times, they have nothing to do with news, or you know, they, they're not the kind of things that would lead a newscast. And they're almost always stuff that we did not film ourselves. They're they're you know short clips that readers, that Alaskans, you know, gave to us that they tagged us in a Facebook post or they emailed to us and and uh, just wanted us to see and and uh, you know we're delighted to get those. And then we we put them on television, we put them on the web, and that's. Um, that's become a big part of, of what we do is just kind of looking for Alaskans to, you know, share their lives with us, share the you know their the awesome videos that they're making with us. And um, in terms of like the the biggest viral videos, I mean, if there's a moose doing something weird, that's probably going to be at the top of the list. A moose in the grocery store, um, a moose did, like just mundane moose things. A moose eating moose a eating pumpkin. Pumpkins, moose like, eating pumpkins. A moose with strange toes. If I'm not right, mistaken. Right. Uh, a moose with a little. A sleigh moose. I'm still kind of traumatized by that video. Sleigh hoof with yeah. the, uh, yeah. it's sad, it's yeah. sad. The moose has like a condition where it's, it's hooves. <laughs> mooses, mooses with conditions. <laughs> curl up, yeah. Um, Conditional well, moose permits, yeah, I'm aware. Right, and it's, I mean, it's the same kind of thing that at the paper when, you know, when you wrote about Buzz Winkle, the moose that had Christmas lights in its, in its antlers, that was a really big story for us. And mm. now, but the difference is now just, you know, since we started doing this work, now everyone has a camera. Now everyone has a, you know, uh, uh, is shooting footage of their lives all the time, and so more than ever, they're giving that to us, and that's doing great for us. Um, so the, the the top videos a lot of times are kind of, are, are pretty silly stuff and have nothing to do with the news of the day. Mm -hmm. And Julia, in your reporting, have you seen more, uh, whether it's videos or photos, but just material that are coming from uh, people outside of newsrooms, whether that's uh, in kind of rural communities where there might not be a news bureau, or even in town with kind of citizen journalism? Uh, one of the more fun stories I did during the Obama visit um, was a story for The Guardian that relied heavily on uh, social media posts from Alaskans, seeing sightings of the president. Um, and, you know, I rely, I kind of, because I'm pitching nationally and internationally, I use my social feeds, which contain a lot of Alaskans, to kind of, uh, as a barometer, to see what people are reacting to. I think that one of the dangers when of new traditional newsroom culture is that you get disconnected from what normal people care about or thinking about, or you get into this thing of thinking, I you know, need to have this intellectual derp -a derp story, but what you really wanna do is just kind of know what people are interested in and serve those interests, so, um, I think, you know, and I teach my students that you really, you can't uh, think you're too smart, you know, <laughs> and you really have to value what regular people are putting on their news feeds. Um, so anyway, um, I had a lot of fun sort of curating news feeds for The Guardian during Obama's visit. It was a, kind of cute. It was mm -hmm. sweet that people were posting pictures of him all over the state. I want to come back to a couple of things that you said, but um, Kyle, in your newsroom, do you guys, uh, are you out scouring the internet for uh, you know, different stuff that's trickling in the same way a reporter might be checking in with a beat on, you know, courts or government institutions, or is this stuff that's all coming towards you from, from viewers? Well, I mean, one thing about KTU is it has a, um, we have a real, we have a pretty broad audience and we have a audience that's um, very strong in rural Alaska. And um, so we get a lot of photos and sometimes videos just sent to us by people who want to show us kind of what's going on in their backyard. 
Um, and then there's a level of, um, and we're not seeing, we don't see a lot of stuff from Twitter. You know, I think Alaska is, has not embraced Twitter the way that, that other places have. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it'll happen mm -hmm. at some point, but, but Alaskans are, they're all on Facebook and that's where they're posting just kind of amazing things all the time. And sometimes it's them showing it to us or someone tagging us in a post that they see. Or, um, you know, I often, if, if I've become, if over the years I've done a story with someone, I'll usually I'll, I'm friends with them on Facebook, and so if someone in Quinnahawk, who I interviewed about, you know, how uh, houses are de deteriorating there that were built by the BIA in the 50s, you know, two years later, that person might catch a shark off the, you know, off the western Alaska coast and post a picture of it, and so stories, many stories come in that way, and, and just trying to establish, you know, relationships with people in interesting places, and um, just you know, if they find something interesting, they're going to share it, and um, now now we have that connection, and I get to see it too, and then it's just a matter of picking up the phone and being like, hey, can we talk about that shark you found? And I, I just want to ask about that, because I remember when I lived in Nome, you would get stories before me about uh, some of the communities out there, whether it was um, whaling activity that was happening or just kind of uh, freak occurrences, and I, I didn't learn until afterwards, it's because you have... Uh, one of the most coveted uh, social media feeds uh, of, of many reporters working in the state. And I, I just want to ask, are, are you really kind of scaling up that model to a newsroom level with what you're doing now? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is I just am old and have been doing it for a while now. And, and um, Julia is nodding, you are old. <laughs> and did, and, and, and <laughs> super old. Um, but, uh, um, but we, you know, I was trying to do this kind of, you know, 2007, 2008. I had a blog called The Village, and it was all, it was kind of nothing but that idea of, Let's reach out to people. That's when smartphones were really taken. That's when the iPhone was kind of mm -hmm. first beginning, you know, and get them to just share these photos with us and sometimes write stories for us that we can post. And so a lot of the relationships come from that kind of era and have been built over time. Or, you, meet, you know, you meet people on, and I, you go to Ruby and you stay at someone's house for I Did Rod and, you know, you just kind of keep in touch with that person. But what happened at KTUU, and when I came in the door, that was in terms of like what we were trying to do was. It went from being, oh, this is a cool thing that we should just be paying attention to and trying to share with our readers to being, okay, this is a core, this is a core thing that we are. You know, we're trying to break news. We're trying to do watchdog journalism as much as we can. We're trying to do enterprise stories. Um, but as important any, uh, as, as any of that stuff is like we're trying to just be engaged with that audience and make sure that if something happens to them that they want to share with the rest of the state, that they do, that they think of us and that we – make it clear to them that no we do want to we want to share what's going on in your lives let's you know it's not just a we're not just talking to you we want you talking back at us mm -hmm. and i, I want to uh take a minute to just show a video of uh byron nikolai a young man from tuksuk bay who started posting uh videos of himself singing and dancing uh, singing and drumming um about a year ago a little bit more and that story was picked up by uh, local news and then statewide and within a year he was performing at the white house and uh, had an album so i just want to show a clip of that if we can Julia, how has the availability of footage kind of like that, that somebody just might post on Facebook on their own time, how has that changed uh, news coverage uh, in the time that you've been working on this stuff? What I like about it? Um, is that it's really democratized kind of people's access to people's voices. You know, it, it used to be that journalists were sort of gatekeepers um, and that journalism organizations were gatekeepers and they decided what the public heard or saw. But what the internet has done in the last 10 years is given people like that person that we just watched, um, given them this ability to go from obscure to famous um, because of their own talent. If you make something interesting and you put it online, you will, you have the ability to reach a lot of people because what you're doing is, is moving people. You know, it's like, I mean, any viral video, it's just that, um, any viral video has that sort of element, that kernel of something that moves people, whether it makes people laugh, whether it's cute, whether it moves people to give money, whatever it is. And I think that that keeps journalism on its toes more because we really need to be thinking, asking ourselves this question, why are we doing this? What's important about this story? Is it useful? 
does it move people? If the answer to those two questions is yes, then we should go forward. But if it is no, then we need to examine kind of what we're doing. That, I think, was a really important question, and I really want to come back <clears throat> to that. And b before there, I want to show another video that was one of the most successful from last year, um, at least in our house, and what we were looking at for our metrics. Um, and so it it's, uh, involves a you know, large mammal and a seafaring no! vessel. Um, I, I just first, Kyle, why was that such a successful video? Why did it travel so far? Uh, you know, what's going on there that's so compelling? I don't know. I mean, we, I, I don't know if there's, a, if there's a formula. I think that probably you, you can engineer a, a viral video, I'm sure, I think, um, and, and people have done it. That one, you know, what we talk about in terms of the stuff that, you know, we're not trying to find stuff that is going to go viral because I don't think that that ever works but like the things we talk about is it you know is it only does it have like three um, properties right is it kind of like this only in Alaska thing you know something that you would not you would not be able to do in any other state right like you know a bear outside your door eating your kayak kind of in a super like in this you know in this really beautiful setting um, in that case it was very much what she was saying because that you know bears are always mucking around and there's Anyone who's lived in Juneau has seen a bear probably, uh, you know, carrying around a trash bag or crossing the road. In that case, it was just her reaction to it. And that was also the case. There was a viral video this year um, of a whale pod breaching. And it's something that we've seen before, but it was the reaction. It was just like this really over-the-top reaction from the person who was viewing it. Um, but usually the stuff that we see go crazy, it's, it's only in Alaska. It, 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 it creates some emotion. You know, I think the stuff that is going to do great on Facebook, it makes you feel something. It makes you feel, you know, sadness or, um, in this case, it was just funny. I mean, it's kind of laugh out loud funny, and that's, um, that's always going to do pretty well. I hesitate to dive into it because I, I don't know what happened, but we, the, the video didn't play. So, uh, you know, doing a deconstruction of some of the specifics. But a story like this where there's not necessarily that much news value, not that much to say beyond what happened, um, I'm just curious. You know, if that's the stuff that's traveling the most, if that's the, doing the most robust in a lot of the arenas that we're measuring success, I mean, is that a kind of sorry, sad state of the times for journalism, or is that just uh, some of the stuff that's making it out? And um, you know, it's uh, it's always been this way, and we just have new metrics for evaluating it. Well, you know, I would say we talk about that in our newsroom, and. You know, what we, one thing I tell the reporters who I work with is, you know, they're not really shooting for those stories. Although, you know, if a moose walks into a, into a, into a grocery store and is eating pumpkin, you know, like eating gourds or whatever, yeah, they're going to make it, they're probably going to call and, and, just, and get that little story. But that doesn't happen very often. And, and those stories, the, su the success of those stories doesn't push out or prohibit the success of other stories. Um, and one thing, you know, I, I've toyed with the idea of kind of publishing our top our most read stories of the year because I'm, I'm really proud of the list because it's not, those stories, they do really well. They kind of rise, they, they get a lot of attention, a lot of people see them, but the stuff that really gets a lot of traffic is actually the newsier, you know, kind of crunchier stuff that we cover. It's um, the breaking news fire coverage, the president's visit, um, election coverage. Um, you know, those stories did as well as anything we've done. So. Um, you know, we're more than happy to kind of take these viral videos as they come, but they, the cost benefit is way out of whack. I mean, there are lots of, lots of people watch them, people like them, we're happy that they enjoy them, but how much time are we actually spending on that? Not a, not a ton. To, to think about it as like a dualism, as like news versus, you know, fluffy internet stuff is sort of wrong. Um, I think that as our audiences are changing, we're working across platforms, so we have a traditional platform that we're used to, and then we have all these other developing platforms that each of them has, their audiences have expectations, They have, there's a different tone necessary to do well in that sort of arena. So, you know, the viral videos work in with a certain audience, and, you know, the crunchy old school news stories work with another audience, but there's like, there's all this sort of 
overlap and interplay. And the other thing that journalists need to be asking themselves with every story that they write is, what is the culture of this place? And the answer to that is this evolving thing. And the thing about those viral videos is that the reason that they have resonance with the audience is because they're hitting on something that is about the culture of the place very often in Alaska. And that is something that happens more here than other places. And one of the things that makes journalism here cooler than other places is that sort of evolving sense of culture and depth and interesting depth of culture here. So I really think you can't discount it. And also it informs things, like especially if you read um, like the social feeds of the Washington Post, that'd be like a really good example of sort of the way that the casual kind of like uh, quirky tastes of the internet have influenced how news is packaged and how stories start to generate, you know, you start to generate stories from interesting headlines. You know, it's like kind of a different way of thinking about it. I don't think it's wrong. Um, I actually think it's right. <laughs> I, I think it helps, I, I can tell you for certain it helps, you know, none of us are, no one in Alaska works in a huge newsroom. I mean, there's just no, meet, no organization is that big. Um, and you're going to be doing some amount, uh, depending on the newsroom, you're going to be doing some amount of kind of breaking news. You're going to be covering a lot of mayhem. You're going to cover every murder probably. There's going to be a story about every fatal accident. And at its worst, you just have a series of headlines that are nothing but just kind of mayhem and murder and crime and, and hopefully hopefully some politics, um, but and almost kind of nothing else. And where this stuff helps, the stuff that comes from the readers and the viewers in our case, the, the way that it helps is it just, you know, Julie and I over the years have talked many times about the idea of what are we trying to do? What we're trying, one thing we're trying to do is hold a mirror up to the place, right? And just kind of reflect back what's happening in the place and what is going on in people's lives. And none of us are getting shot at every day. None of us are, you know, in the legislature. Um, but we do, we are, we are seeing the Northern Lights where, you know, we're going out to look at them where we're going sledding. And so all this other content that we're getting, and a lot of times it's not viral. It's like this kind of other level of just like, oh, that's neat. You know, here's a video of someone out sledding in the new snowfall or just kind of, in, you know, like uh, water skiing um, in Yakutat, something that, that is, is, is cool and it's unique to this place, but it's just like a little slice of life. And for me, that's really valuable. And we actually do kind of try and, you know, when there's a lot of that negative news, I, <laughs> we try and, you know, just relieve it with some of that stuff from, from users. Mm -hmm. I, I want to do ask about some of the economics behind it because uh, particularly in commercial ventures, what are the pressures to make sure that you have content that fits a uh, kind of viral mold that can travel, that can get clicks, that can um, fit with the expectations of advertisers? And how do you balance that against some news that just might not be as popular? But do advertisers even understand the value of viral content? The thing about it is my, my feeling is that advertising is just catching up, you know, especially on a local level, is just catching up to sort of how the internet works. And, you know, one of the things I think about on my blog, which has still advertising and also offer sponsored content, is that I think that sponsored content is a far more, val uh, provides far more value to my advertisers, but advertisers have a hard time wrapping their mind around it. They're used to like a still, you know, a still square that would run in the newspaper running on a blog. But does that get a lot of clicks? No, no, it doesn't. However, if I were to take their product and, you know, if they were to take their product and have someone write about it in the same tone as my blog with, you know, lots of visuals that, um, and then that would move on social networks, that would have SEO, it would be Googleable, it could be pinned on Pinterest. So at that point, you know, it's like that is such a more interesting thing. But I would venture to say that there, the, there aren't, I think that there's always pressure to get clicks, right? But is that pressure then turning into money for our organizations? I don't know that it's like, it's going slow. You know, I think our organizations are still making money the way, for the most part, the way that they've always traditionally done it. And that would be selling ads in print and selling ads, um, commercial ad space on, you know, uh, television. Mm -hmm. And before we, uh, I, I just want to touch on one topic that I, I think is kind of really relevant to this, and that's um, we have uh, three of the very big news stories that I was tracking this year had to do with um, footage that came from incidents with police and alleged police brutality. Um, and so we have a little bit of a clip, hopefully it'll play this time, uh, from a footage from um, the Sitka Police Department and alleged uh, excessive force. Um, so, and just a oh, word of caution, it is a little bit uh, upsetting to watch. <laughs>
Um, I guess my question with this and with some of the other stories uh, is, did the video make the story? And what's the role of uh, footage like this coming out with how it ends up being covered at a state or uh, even national level? I mean, the, the Kodiak case, there was uh, just a um, viral thing that was going out nationally about that incident. Well, I, I mean, I can tell you one thing I've learned making the transition from newspapers to a, a TV station. Um, I mean, as a reporter, I kind of always have been drawn to just telling stories online um, because I can I can write my story, but I also have this platform. I, you know, I can embed video throughout. I, it's just it, it's kind of where this thing feels like it wants to go, right? In terms of the experience for the reader, um, but watching how decisions are made for um, for a, a television broadcast for the 6 p.m. newscast is, you know, that's a that's a video medium. It's stories are told using video, right? And so. Um, so is that footage, to say that something like an affidavit getting released, you know, months after the incident might have happened, that's not as compelling for some mediums as uh, security footage like what we just saw? Well, that's it's gonna it's gonna make it travel on television, it's, you know, I, absolutely, and it's gonna make it probably travel outside the state because other you know networks will pick it up. Um, you know, we're really focused on our audience and what can we tell our audience and what are they going to be interested in. Um, so we were going to tell if if a story matters, we're going to try and find a way to to tell it for sure. Um, but you know, as more and more of that footage, you know, the um, the prison deaths is another good example. You know, that's there have been more headlines this week and other video released of these of people dying in prison. Um, it's not something you would see much of ten years ago or like when I started. You just didn't have a way to you you would write a story. You'd write a third what you know what we call like a thirty inch story, and you'd describe in detail, moment by moment, what happened. And in this case, um, it's right there to be seen. It's, it's playing right in your Facebook feed. And, um, well, and I, I just, uh, I'm pushing back slightly, like I, even when these deaths happened uh, several months or a little over a year ago, in some cases, they did not receive as much coverage as now the news that the videos might come out about them will have. Well, the, well you also had, I think they received, you know, the, the paper covered the deaths, I think, uh, you know, each one pretty well. I, I felt um, there were definitely when I was looking back for stories because you want to you want to see well, okay what have we said about this before. There were stories at each point. Um, I think the tipping point in terms of really certainly certainly the videos got a lot of attention. But remember before the videos came out or at the same time there was the you know uh, the governor ordered a report that was hypercritical of the correction system. And that was on the heels of another report that was critical of the correction system. So like the context had really been dialed up. Now there's all this tension of like there's a lot of people looking at these deaths and there's been some decisions made and some conclusions drawn. Um, so I think, you know, would the stories have gotten as much attention without the videos? I don't know. I mean those maybe not, but those reports were pretty uh, striking and were kind of big news no matter what. But what the, when we think about the audience of the internet, so the internet is this emotional sphere, right? And people who are looking at it are maybe not traditional news readers or that they're, they're developing a relationship with news that's different than people who've like traditionally got it, you know, from the newspaper or from watching the newscast. Um, but what you're witnessing is the power of the internet when, because it is this emotional world. Um, if you have an unmediated experience. So instead of being mediated through me, the reporter, you just see it for yourself, you're gonna have an emotional reaction and that's just gonna be more powerful. Um, and that's the thing that's so cool and also can go awry with the internet is that there is nobody standing between you and this raw, immediate content. I mean, the, the hard part is the, say someone watches two minutes of that video you know, and we see it on Facebook comments all the time. You can tell that people aren't reading the stories. Maybe they watch the video, and there's all this context. I mean, the, you had the the union for the the uh, corrections officers yesterday saying, "Well, it's, there's a lot more you need to know than just kind of watching two or or five minutes of video." And so that definitely is the challenge: is the video can be can be consumed without it can be consumed without any context, right? And so that's where we're trying, like, that's it's on us to figure out how to present that those clips in context so that we're informing people and not just encourage them, encouraging them to lead to conclusions. And before, I, we are really close to the end of this program and before we dive into kind of the different, um, some of these different issues, I do just want to ask if each of you quickly could kind of weigh in. Um, 
you know, when the panic alarms get pressed about viral videos and stuff, are we seeing, you know, an end or a, a dualism between serious journalism and stuff that clicks well and travels well? Or is this just an expansion of the toolkit in both of your opinions? Uh, I see it as um, like a kind of an ecosystem. You know, um, if you look like at the um, bombing and shootings in Paris, um, one of the things that was pretty amazing about that as it was unfolding, and actually my students analyzed this, is just um, we looked pretty soon. You saw there was, for example, there was this amazing video. I have to wrap up. I'm so oh, sorry. And okay. Kyle, I have no time for you. I'm very sorry. Oh. Uh, thank you to both of my guests for joining me here, and uh, thank you at home for joining us as well. For Alaska Edition, I'm Zachariah Hughes. If you have questions or comments about the program, you can email Alaska Edition at alaskapublic.org or write us at 3877 University Drive, Anchorage, Alaska, 99508. Alaska Edition is a production of KAKM. The opinions expressed are those of the hosts and guests and do not necessarily represent those of KSKA, KAKM, the licensee, or their underwriters. <laughs> <laughs>